Well, good morning, everyone here at North Campus, all of you at Central Campus and Woodland Park Campus. Good morning. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Well, you know, today we are in part three of our series, Following Jesus, and today we are looking at the purpose of praise and worship. How many of you know praise and worship is not just something we do at the beginning of a church service? It's a very essential and important part of every believer's life. And so we're going to take a look at that today. And, uh, you know, we just came through an amazing time where for the last year, we as a church, as a congregation, a church family, we were praying and believing God to move in miraculous ways here in our city through the Living Proof Tent Crusade. And, uh, you know, it's just been a couple of weeks since that took place. And I've been reminded again and again of the story of the 10 lepers. And if, if you've never heard that story, let me tell it quickly. But Jesus said there were 10 lepers, and, and they came, and Jesus healed them. He, he told them to go and show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were healed, all 10 of them. And one of those lepers came back to Jesus and began to praise him loudly. And I have always been amazed at Jesus' response. He said, where are the other nine? And, you know, he's Jesus. He's the son of God. He knew where the other nine were. But he was making a point for all of us to remember, to behold, and, and to learn from that every time the Lord does something amazing and wonderful in our lives, the only reasonable response is to come back and worship him loudly and praise him for the great things that he has done. And the fact that we had this uh, amazing tent crusade and the fact that the tent is no longer here, as a matter of fact, um, Zach, did, is that the tent you drove to Batavia, New York, where they will be having another crusade in Batavia, and then the Trump family is going to use it for an Awake America rally after that. So Zach just got back from that. I mean, <laughs> so God is doing something in the midst of us. I believe the great awakening has begun. And we need to give him praise for that today. We need to give him praise. Now, um, it's amazing, the second day of the crusade, our family seemed to come under immense attacks from the powers of darkness. And the reality is that when you are plundering hell, the enemy doesn't just throw up a little surrender flag and say, oh, you win. <laughs> Understand, when you are on the front lines of battle, you are going to take some hits. How many of you have taken some hits in your life? And, and instead of running to the corner and hunkering down, whimpering and crying and having a pity party, we need to stand up and rejoice that we've been counted worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. And something the Lord has been teaching me through this, because I'm telling you since day two of the crusade, it is amazing. Blow after blow after blow that has come to our family, the Hudnall family, and to many of our staff and those in our church family. And so one night I was walking with the Lord, and for the first quarter of a mile, I just wept. And just, I left the house, walked out of the door, and I said, Abba, Daddy... I just need to walk with you and talk with you. And for the first quarter of a mile, all I did was weep and pour my heart out to him. And after about a quarter of a mile, it was as if the Holy Spirit stepped in and said, okay, sweetheart, now I'm taking over. <laughs> and the Lord began to teach me again that this is what he said to me. He said, did you not pray that you would be a book of Acts church? And it stunned me. And I, you know, I, without saying it out loud in my spirit, I, I affirmed that. Yes, Lord, we've been praying and praying. How many of you were here for the Book of Acts series? How many weeks was that, Todd? 50-some weeks? 36. 36. 36. <laughs> 
But we did, had a series on the book of Acts called Watch Me Burn because I love what Dutch Sheets reminded us of a couple weeks ago that God made the church the way he wanted it. Now he wants the church the way he made it. Yeah. He wants the church in America to quit being like the church in America and to become the church God created and intended for us to be again. And so the Lord, I'm crying, going, God, we have just been hit blow after blow after blow after blow. And the Lord said, did you not ask to be a Book of Acts church? And then he reminded me, how many people answered those altar calls in that tent? 3,600 people came forward in those altar calls. More than 3,000 people surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. And the Lord reminded me of that and said, you are living in the book of Acts. And then he took me to Paul and Silas in Acts 16. And of course, I didn't have my Bible there with me. I'm walking and I'm just silent now as the Holy Spirit is just speaking to me and giving me this download. And he reminds me of Paul and Silas. It was in the book of Acts. It was in the book of Acts that they saw miracles, signs, and wonders. It was in the book of Acts that they saw more than 3,000 people, 3,000 people added to the church on the day of Pentecost. This is the book of Acts. And at, with the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the salvation comes opposition from the enemy. So Christians, we have to be aware in this season that we are in a real battle but God always wins. We're on the winning team. And when you're really engaged in the battle, listen, it would be a tragedy for you to go, go to heaven and stand before the Lord with shiny armor that has no scars, no marks, no scratches, no dents. We, if we are really in the battle, we're going to take some hits. Come on. And we are going to be like the disciples in the book of Acts who said, where it said of them that they counted themselves blessed. They praised God that they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ. So we're in the book of Acts, giving praise for it. That's the time we're in. And it's important that in the book of Acts, when things don't turn out the way we thought they were, would, that we don't go to our corner and sulk and cry and self-pity but like Paul and Silas, when they were thrown in prison for casting the demons out of a slave girl fortune teller, they, that we don't fall into self-pity, that we don't fall into despair and discouragement, licking our wounds, saying, oh, poor, poor me. But we have got to choose to be like Paul and Silas, who were in stocks and bonds, chains, in the innermost prison. And at midnight, they begin to sing praises loudly to God. Amen. And how many of you know what happened? An earthquake, a supernatural divine earthquake came through the prison. The prison doors flew open. The chains fell off and salvation had, took place in that prison and God was glorified once again. Some of you are in a situation right now that's painful. Some of you are in a situation right now where you're confused and you're saying, God, what happened? God, don't you love me? God, where are you? God, some of you are there right now at every campus. Some of you at Woodland Park, you're questioning God. You're questioning his faithfulness because you have served him faithfully as a good soldier and you're right now licking your wounds. And God wants you to be reminded that when you are in this battle against the principalities and the powers of darkness and the spirits of wickedness, you're going to take some hits, but he is with you and he will restore you. He will bind up all your wounds. He will heal your broken heart if you will begin to praise him and worship him through it. Give him glory. Woo. All right. I'm on fire. I'm going to watch me burn. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to do this. But first, I, I want to honor two amazing generals that were so instrumental in carrying out the details of that tent crusade. Mario and Michelle sat with us at breakfast. Mario said, this was the biggest and the best crusade we've ever had. And then Michelle said, I wish we could clone you and your church and have you in every city that God calls us to. Get up here, Mark and Melissa, right now. And I just want to honor these two generals. You know, 
for all that they did over and above, over and above. Love you. Love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, I, I want you all to see, it's harvest time. It's harvest time. All right. Be sure and, and just thank them for all they did because they went over and above. And I know our entire church family did. Our entire staff did. Um, but, but I just believe that, that the Lord said it's very important to honor them and the sacrifice and the commitment they made to see over 3,000 people come to Jesus. All right. I hope you're taking notes. For those of you who are new to Radiant, download the Radiant app on your phone if you haven't already done that. And you can take notes right there. There are sermon notes. You can uh, fill in the blanks. You can email it to yourself, print it out if you want to keep it for future reference. But I do believe it's important when you come to the Lord, whether it's in private or whether it's corporately, that you come prepared. You're, I've said this before. Bring your journal, bring a notebook, bring your Bible. It's like coming to a buffet with an empty plate so that you can pile it on and you can take it with you and you can continue to feast on what the Lord reveals to you. So be a student of the word. Be a student of the scripture. Come hungry. Don't be an American Christian that just comes in to have your ears tickled with a nice little message and then we leave unchanged. Come on. We, we are not wimps. We're warriors. And God has called us to, to be a sober and alert, to pay attention in this time. It's harvest time. And we are in the book of Acts. A great awakening is just beginning. I want you to turn in your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 5. One of the most powerful and precious passages in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 5, John the Revelator. He gives us a glorious picture of what takes place around the throne of God and what will ultimately take place in heaven and on earth one day. You see, the day is coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is what John saw beginning in verse 19. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry verse 9 through 14. He said, they sang a new song. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. John said, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels. Now, I don't want you to just skim past this. I want to ask you right now to really get a picture of this in your mind. He said that he heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Listen, I'm not a mathematician, but I know we're talking millions of angels. He's hearing millions of angels. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, everybody say it with me, in a loud voice, say a loud voice, a loud voice. They were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Come on, give him praise at every campus right now. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. He said, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. I, for one, do not want to wait until that day to worship him like he deserves to be worshiped. 
I choose to worship him today and every day from now into and throughout eternity because he's worthy. Come on, is anybody with me today? He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Point number one, this, this is the first reason that praise and worship is so important. And for anyone who thought, well, praise and worship, it's that little thing you do for a few minutes every time you come to church. Erase that, delete that from your mind. We worship God. We praise God, number one, because he's worthy of our praise and our worship. He's worthy. He's worthy. Psalm 18.3, it says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Listen, he is worthy yesterday today and forever. He's worthy of your praise and your worship. So choose to praise him and worship him continually. Listen, we worship him because he's worthy. That means you don't worship him when you feel like it. You don't worship him once your circumstances have changed and they've lined up with how you want them to be. We don't wait to worship him until they, the worship team does the song that we want to hear. You know what that's called? It's called, in large part, American Christianity. God forgive us and deliver us from it. But it's called idolatry. Because every time I refuse to worship and praise the lamb who was slain, every time you and I refuse to worship him and praise him, it is idolatry. Because what we're saying is we're saying, I put myself above God, and I will only worship God when I feel like it, when I am emotionally moved, when they do the songs or the style of praise and worship that touches my heart. I get it that there are different styles and different songs that touch each one of our hearts. If we were to go around this room today or at any of our campuses and say, what's your favorite worship song? What's your favorite song to sing to the Lord? We'd hear a hundred different ones between the, the 2,000 people. We would hear so many different choices. But the reality is, I don't worship him because I feel like it. I don't worship him because I'm moved. I don't worship him because they're doing the style or the song that, that I wanted to hear that's my favorite. Come on, is anybody with me today? I worship him because he's worthy. And to refuse to do so is idolatry. I'm putting myself above him and saying, I will worship him when I feel like it. And that means we don't wait until we get to church to praise and to worship him. He's worthy to be praised continually, every day, throughout the day and the night. Psalm 34 verse 1 this, listen to the words of King David. He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. Say it with me, at all times. He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And it's important to know that when David spoke these words, he was being hunted down by Saul's people. He was being hunted down and his life was being threatened. And so David didn't say, well, once God gets me through this, then I'll praise him. He said, no, I will bless the Lord at all times, in the good times, in the bad times. He said, his praise will continually be in my mouth. We don't wait until, again, I, I wanna say this again, I wanna make sure everyone understands this. I know you all have different songs that you like and different styles at every campus, but understand, we don't stand there and wait until they do our song or our style. I, I, I'm going to say it again because I feel prompted to. Friends, that is idolatry. It, it doesn't matter. You know what? You can, you can sing. You can lead songs that, that are not my favorite all day long. I'll still praise him because he's worthy. And that's the reason we praise him and worship him. You don't even need a worship leader or a band or a team. I'm so glad we have amazing worship teams at all of our campuses, aren't you? Give God praise for that. Thank him for that. But you don't have to have that to worship God continually. You don't have to have an instrument. You don't even have to have a good singing voice. Come on, some of you, some of you who don't have the greatest singing voice, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's, that's okay. You don't have to have. It, it says in Psalm 100, verses 1 through 3, it says, make a joyful shout. 
to the Lord. Another translation says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you people. All you people. It doesn't say, make a joyful shout to the Lord if you have a good singing voice. No, it says, all you people. It says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. He's worthy of our praise and our worship. So don't ever hold back your praise and your worship. The word worship comes from an old English word, that worth-ship, meaning that God is worthy He deserves your praise. And your worship is your response to all God is, all he says, all he's done, all he's doing, and all he will do. Yesterday, today, and forever, he's worthy of our worship. And worship is the heart's natural response to the author and the giver of life. Uh, The three wise men in Matthew 2 They had been searching for the Messiah. And I want you to listen to their response when they saw him in Matthew 2, verses 10 to 12. It says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Listen, when the Messiah came, they had been hearing for thousands of years, he's coming, he's coming, Messiah is coming, he's coming to save his people, he's coming. And when he came, the natural response was to bow down and worship him. So by all means, church, today, I I want to admonish you with the love of the Lord to never hold back your praise and your worship for the King of Kings, the one who loves you so much that he was not willing to spend eternity without you. So he stepped down from heaven. He stepped into humanity. He lived a perfect, sinless life so that he could go to the cross in your place as the perfect sacrifice once and for all, for all the sins of mankind forever and ever. Listen, how or why, why oh why would we ever hold back our praise and our worship of the lamb who was slain for the sins of the world? Give him praise again now. But you see, Satan always comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he comes to steal what belongs to God, what belongs to God and God alone, and to take it for himself. So he will try to steal God's praise and worship from, and to keep it from ever coming out of your mouth and ever being demonstrated in and through your life. He works to silence you and keep you from praising and worshiping God. Now, you may say, oh, well, it's just because I'm a more reserved person. No, it's because you have an enemy that wants to disable you spiritually and keep you from doing what God created you to do. And so he works to keep us silent and to stop us, to get us to hold back our praise and our worship of God. He does it through pride now, we would never call it that, but that's, that's what it is. He does it through self-centeredness. Well, what will people think if they see me or hear me praising God? Or he does it through ignorance, keeping people ignorant to the reality of, of how powerful and important praise and worship is. He does it through deception. And again, he does it through idolatry. He does it through idolatry because we focus our attention and our worship on other things, people, and passions rather than focusing it on God and God alone who's worthy. He even tried this with Jesus in Matthew 4. It says in verse 8, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to Jesus, all this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. I love it. He said, not today, Satan. Away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. To worship anything or anyone else is idolatry. Worship is reserved for God and God alone. Worship him every day, throughout the day. Let his praises continually be in your mouth because he's worthy. Number two. You were created to praise and worship God. You were created for this. 
This is so powerful. Don't miss this. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to read it from the Amplified text today. Paul says, and I relate so deeply with Paul because Paul was so passionate and so bold and, and he was always pleading and urging and with the, the body of Christ, with the church. And, and he's doing that here. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. Paul is saying here, in light of the mercies of God, in light of everything that he's done, he said, your only reasonable response to the one who laid down his life for you to give you eternal life, the only reasonable response for us is to offer our lives and our bodies as a sacrifice to him. Amen? Amen. Oh, give him your highest praise every day, all the time. This is what you were created for. Don't hold back your praise and your worship. And I understand that it feels a little awkward at first. Listen, I was raised in the Catholic Church, and we did not praise God in Mass like we praise God at Radiant Church. I mean, it was totally different. So I get it. For those of you who are new to praising and worshiping God like David did, and, and the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart because he worshiped God loudly with singing and dancing and shouting, and he worshiped God with, with such fervor and passion that he was ridiculed and mocked and scorned for it. And I love his response. If you think this is bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. And, and, and God wants every one of us to worship him and praise him with total abandon like that because it's what we were created for. So much so that he said, if you don't, even the rocks are going to cry out because he's worthy. But I understand that at first it's awkward. I remember the first time I went into a spirit-filled, fire-baptized Pentecostal church and uh, I was a teenager. I was a rebellious teenager, and my parents drug me to church. Parents, as long as your kids are under your roof, you are obligated to get them to church. And listen, any kids that are here today, and you say, my parents made me be, to, made me be here. Well, you need to thank your parents for being great parents, because that is our responsibility. But my dad drug me to church, sometimes kicking and screaming, literally. I mean, I remember one day I had such an attitude and he grabbed me by the arm. He pulled me down the hall, put me in the car because I did not want to go to church. And he said, as long as you live under this roof, you're going to church, sister. Listen, I'm so glad he did. I'm a spirit filled, fire baptized, holy woman of God today because my dad forced me to come to church. But I got to tell you, when I walked in and these people were dancing and shouting and singing and rejoicing, it was crazy. That is not what I grew up in, in mass and catechism. So I get it that it's a little awkward at first, but I'm telling you, it's kind of like riding a bike, learning to ride a bike, or a baby learning to walk for the first time. You're, you're a little trembly at first, and, and it's a little awkward at first, but then you begin to lift up holy hands, as the Bible tells us to, just to praise him because he's worthy of your praise. And listen, you, some of you may say, why do you lift up your hands? Well, the Bible says lift up holy hands to the Lord. And uh, something for me that is so powerful and personal is I think of how the Lord said that we have to come to him with childlike faith. And there are so many times when I lift up my hands to him and it's like a child coming to their dad and I'm coming to Abba, Father, Daddy, God, and I'm stretching up my hands to him because I know how desperately I need him and because I love him and I want him to to embrace me and to pick me up and dance me around the room and through life. And, and I know that may sound funny. And for those of you who don't have that kind of intimacy with God, he wants that kind of intimacy with you. 
He desires that with you. He's the best daddy you can ever imagine. And your earthly daddy maybe was very imperfect, maybe even dysfunctional, maybe even abusive, but your heavenly father, your Abba, will never do anything to hurt you. He will only be there to help you and to build you up into the man or the woman of God that he created you to be. It's an act of surrender. It's saying, oh God, You're worthy of my praise. I praise you and I surrender all to you. But listen, I I want to encourage every one of you, do what you were created to do and praise God. Worship God with total abandon. Don't let anything hold you back. Don't let inhibitions hold you back. I know for me, it was awkward at first. And I know some of you who know me, you're going, wow, I can't imagine it ever being awkward for you, Pastor Kelly. But it was But the more I chose to do it, the more I chose to praise him throughout the day, every day, it became more and more natural. And now it is as natural to me as breathing. I mean, it's not unusual. You can ask my kids. It is not unusual. Don't ask Pastor Todd because he never goes shopping with me. We do not shop together and our marriage is stronger for it. (laughs) But you can ask my kids (laughs) that... It's not unusual for me to walk through a store or a hospital or a school or a park or my neighborhood and just begin to praise God and just begin to sing songs to him. It is as natural as breathing now. And now I'm going to say something. This is maybe the most important thing you're going to hear me say all weekend. So at every campus, I want you to pay very close attention and I want you to listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us today. You and I were created to praise and worship God. And until we choose to function as we were created to function, we will be spiritually disabled. Did you hear that? Because as I was preparing this message, the Holy Spirit said, you have to share this with him. You were created to worship God, to praise God continually. And so when you're not doing it, you're spiritually disabled. You're not doing what you were created to do. Some of you, you feel continually defeated, spiritually weak, lacking purpose. And I know all of us sense that and feel that at times. And the best way to shake it and come back into alignment with God is through praise and worship. But if you're feeling defeated, spiritually weak, lukewarm in your faith, dry in your spiritual life, lacking purpose, it may very well be the fact that you are not doing what you were created to do. You were created to praise God and worship him continually. So don't hold back your praise. And you know what's interesting is what comes so naturally for many of us is griping, grumbling, murmuring, and complaining. You were not created for that. And that's why you're miserable and depressed, and you make others miserable and depressed. Because you're being someone you were never created to be. God's identity is you are a priest. You are a royal priest. And you were created to proclaim the praises of God continually. So when when you live according to a false identity, and you gripe, and you grumble, and you murmur, and you complain, and nah, 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 you're spiritually disabled. And the enemy cheers and rejoices and says, oh, we got that one. We've got that one. And listen, I am speaking the truth to you today. And some of you don't like it. That's because God is speaking the truth, and he's revealing the lies of the enemy. Today, your path to freedom is to become a praiser and a worshiper of the Most High God because that's what you were created to do. Now, at every campus, I am going to debunk a demonic myth or deception in the church that many have bought into. Now, I know it's mainly in American Christianity because in third world countries, this is not an issue. But I have heard people make excuses for why they don't participate in praising and worshiping God outwardly. And I'm only saying this because God loves you and I love you. But I've heard people give the excuses, well, that's just not how I'm wired. 
Listen, you were created by God to worship and to praise him. Oh yeah, yeah if you say it's not how I'm wired, you're living according to a false identity. Others will say, well, I'm just more of a reserved person or I'm not demonstrative like you and like others. Yet I know that those very same people will go to a Broncos game or their favorite sporting event (laughs) and suddenly they're a worshiper. I mean, they will jump, they will shout, they will even dance, woo! I mean, they will chant, they will go crazy. But then when it comes to God, They say, well, that's just not who I am. Now, if you're mad at me right now over saying that, it's because God just touched your idol. (laughs) So let it go, let it go, let it go. Because you will be spiritually disabled until you begin to function and flow as God, the author and giver of life, the one who created you in his image according to his likeness, until you begin to function in the way that he created you to. Number three, praise and worship changes us. And every one of us needs to be changed. Every one of us. Listen, I know. Every single one of you, there's not an exemption in this house. We all need to be changed. Because I know there's no one in here who would say, I am perfectly, 100%, just like Jesus. Oh, no, you're not. (laughs) And, And those closest to you can tell you very adamantly, oh, no. You've got a long way to go. And I'll be the first one to admit, I've got a long way to go. But I want you to see something. Jeremiah 2, verse 5, it says, they followed worthless idols and they became worthless themselves. Because the reality is that you become like what you worship. So whatever it is that you put your focus on is what you will become like. If all your focus is on on the world, the world's system, the world's belief system, if all your focus is is on the, the things of the world, worldly entertainment, the secular voices that, that come through music and media, social media, if if your focus is primarily on the God of this world and the messages that he produces, that's what you're gonna be like. That's why we have a lot of woke Christians today because their focus and what they're listening to is not the voice of God, but it's the voice of the world and the culture. And we become like what we worship, what we focus on, what we embrace. I know this personally because before I came to Christ, that's what I worshiped. I worshiped the world, the culture, and I became like the world and the culture. I became dark, immoral, corrupt, selfish, prideful. I was a mess. Because every, it's true for every single human being. We're all, we were created to worship, so we're gonna worship something or someone. And you either worship God or you worship the God of this world, Satan. And you may say, well, I've never been a part of a satanic church. I've never been a part of the the occult or of a witch's coven or anything like that. How could you say I worship Satan? Because there's only two choices. You either worship God and become more like him, or you worship and serve the devil and become more like him. And so today I plead with you to praise and worship him continually. And the more you do, the more you become like him. I can tell you with myself, the more I praise him, the more I worship him, the more I'm filled with faith and hope and peace and love, all of the fruit of the spirit. So I'm going to say something that's going to be a big indictment against me, and I know it, that when I start acting nasty, And when I'm not loving and I'm not kind and when I say nasty things, listen, all of you Christians, when you begin to gossip and slander your brother or your sister and talk badly about them, listen, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. It's because you have taken your focus off of God and you've stopped praising and worshiping him and you've gotten your focus on yourself and on others And so God is calling all of us back 
to being true worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. And the more we worship him, the more we become like him, the freer we are. I know that personally, when I start to go into the darkness of depression, discouragement, defeat, despair, is there anyone in this room that never has to battle that? Anyone at any campus? There's not a single hand raised because it's a strategy of hell to destroy us, to kill, steal, and destroy. But I know it's a guarantee every time. If, if I start going down into the doldrums, I know if I will get to a place where I can get my eyes back on Jesus and begin to worship him and praise him, that it changes me because it changes my focus. As long as your focus is on you, you're going to be miserable and depressed. And, and I just, I have to say this right now. Some of you are miserable and depressed and it's because your focus is not on God. It's on you and it's on your problems. It's on your, your pain. And I understand you can go to God with your pain. He cares about your pain, but don't you dare keep, but stay focused on that. You leave it at the feet of Jesus and you turn your focus to Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's why we're told in Isaiah 61 to put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Listen, none of us has to stay heavy. None of us has to stay discouraged and defeated. We put on the garments of praise and focus on the God who is bigger and greater. Number four, praise and worship leads us into the presence of God. How many of you ex have experienced that? When you begin to praise him and worship him and you can just sense his presence. And it's true privately and corporately. In Psalm 22, 3, in the King James Version, it says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. And in the NIV, it puts it this way. It says, But you, God, you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Now, I want to remove any blockage if someone says, Oh, that's just speaking to Israel. Listen, today, he has engrafted us into the vine both Jew and Gentile. You maybe were not born a Jew. I consider myself a Jew at heart, even though I was born in Kansas and, uh, and, and I'm mainly German, <laughs> German descent. But I consider myself a Jew at heart because I am a child of the King of Kings. So this applies to every one of us. And, and I love the picture here. He inhabits the praises of his people. That word habits means he lives, he dwells, he exists, he abides, he remains. Listen, we all want the presence of God in our lives, right? Then enthrone him with your praises. Because he says he will inhabit, he will live in the praises of his people. You know where he will not live? Where there's griping and grumbling and complaining and dissension and division and condemnation. Nope, God will not dwell. His presence will not dwell there. And so by all means, don't hold back your praise. Enthrone him with your praises everywhere you go. Just begin to praise him. It's so true corporately as well. How many of you have ever gone to a church service or a religious service which was more, just could be more described as the church of the frozen chosen? Where, where it's time people are singing, they're singing hymns, they're singing choruses, and the people look like they're members of the wax museum or something. I mean, they're, they're stoic, they're not moved. I've been in services like that before and it broke my heart. And I will never forget one day seeing it and I began to weep and I said, Lord, if I didn't know better, I would think these people don't know you. Because when you know him, when you know who he is, you know he's worthy and deserving of your praise. And you just begin to praise him. You know, something that was so spectacular in the tent was seeing 200 youth, 200 teenagers passionately praising God and going after him. Because he's enthroned in the praises of his people. And one of the new converts that got radically saved and healed I mean, she was like a, a walking dead person. She, she just was so afflicted in her body and so weak and frail. God healed her and then he, and he saved her. He forgave her ever since. He made her a, a child of the king. And she and her brother both told me 
that when they came into the tent, that they could sense the presence of God. And they said something that moved them and inspired them so much was seeing 200 teenagers passionately praising God. Listen, you know what they were doing? They were enthroning him with their praises. So by all means, when you come to church, enter in, enthrone him with your praises together with us. You know, every time I preach, I think I need an hour. Number five, praise (laughs) overcomes the darkness. Psalm 8.2 says, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. I love that the word of God tells us even the weakest among us can take, take up the weapon of praise and worship and God will use it to establish a stronghold against the enemy and silence the enemy and the avenger. So listen, the next time the enemy comes after you and it feels like he's just striking you blow after blow after blow to defeat you, anybody ever go through seasons like that? The worst thing you can do is fall to to the floor and have a pity party. The best thing you can do is stand up like Paul and Silas in the prison and begin to passionately praise him. I'm gonna close with this this, uh, story from Derek Prince. And uh, Derek Prince has been in heaven for quite some time now, but I will never forget the story he told when he was a young pastor. He had just started pastoring, and he said there was a woman coming to their church, and he, had had, he was having a prayer meeting at their home. So it was him, his wife and himself and a small group of people gathered at his home, and there was a knock at the door. He opened the door, and this woman was standing there with a man that they had never met, and she said, this is my husband. He just got out of prison today, and he has demons. He needs to be delivered from demons. Can you help us? And Derek said he didn't know how to cast out a demon. He had never learned that, but he knew he was supposed to. So he said, sure, come on in. And he said, I didn't know what to do. So I just had everyone just start loudly praising God. And he, so he said that small group of people was just loudly praising God, just, just praising him and worshiping him. And the man started shrieking and he said, I can't take it. I can't take it. I've got to get out of here. And Derek said to the man, he said, it's not you that can't take it. It's the demons in you that can't stand the praise of God. And he said, sir, if you leave now, you're going to leave and the demons are going to stay with you. He said, but if you stay, God will deliver you and the demons will leave you. And so he stayed and he said they continued to praise God for about 10 more minutes. And after about 10 minutes, the man jumped up and started praising God with them. And he said, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. They're gone, I'm free. So remember, remember this important truth. That praise and worship isn't something we do for a few minutes when we come together. Praise and worship is an essential habit of a passionate follower of Jesus. And it is what brings the breakthrough and the victory in our lives again and again and again. And don't forget, until you choose to function as God created you to, you will be spiritually disabled, but you don't have to be. God does not want you to be spiritually disabled any longer. He wants you to go to the next level of glory with him. All right, we're gonna pray today. I wanna pray with everyone at all campuses now before we close out this service. But first, I wanna ask every believer at every campus to be praying right now for anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior because it is the most tragic thing in a person's life for you to live and continue to live without Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. Because when, until Jesus Christ becomes the Lord of your life, there is no hope for true and lasting peace. There is no hope for eternal life. Until Jesus Christ becomes your Lord and Savior, you will never experience the joy, the peace, the assurance, the relationship with God that he desires to have with you. So right now, with believers at every campus praying, I wanna ask, I'm gonna pray first, Lord, I ask right now that you would bring conviction to every person at each campus that is not right with you. 
And I ask Holy Spirit that they would be able to sense the reality of your holy conviction and that you would make them miserably uncomfortable continuing in their sin, continuing in a life trapped by the lies of hell. Oh God, stir up a holy discontentment in them so that today they will rise up like that man and be free be forgiven of all their sins and be given a brand new life through Jesus Christ. Today, if you came here in any kind of bondage or oppression, God does not want you to leave that way. He wants you to leave gloriously healed, saved, delivered, and set free. So right now with heads bowed and eyes closed, and you say, why do you do that? Because I wanna remove every hindrance that the enemy will use to keep people from saying, I need Jesus. And so right now, heads are bowed, eyes are closed at every campus. But if, you, if you're here today and you know I need to get right with God, would you just lift your hand so that I can see who I'm praying with today? Just lift your hand and say, I need to be set free. I need to know Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And now we're gonna pray together with those who raise their hands at every campus. I wanna ask you to pray this together with me. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, believe I believe that you love me, you love and, you me and you sent your Son to rescue me. To rescue. And Jesus, Jesus, I believe you are Lord. Are you, Lord. You, died you died for me and as me. And as me. You, shed you shed your blood for the forgiveness of my sin. And today, Jesus, I surrender to you. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I turn from sin and darkness. And I turn to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Holy Spirit, come upon me and empower me to be who you created me to be. For the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise. The greatest miracle that ever happens is when a person is translated out of darkness into the kingdom of light.